welcome to the Explaining History podcast. And uh, today I want to talk about uh, the relationship between uh, Louis George and Nazi Germany um, later in Louis George's life, in the second part of the 1930s. And it's um, an episode which has uh, attracted a great deal of controversy um, over over the years. And um, the question as to Louis George, George's judgment um, following the end of the Second World War has been widely debated. I think it's worth um, looking at things through a kind of um, the, the, the prism of, um, and not necessarily objectivity, but, but trying not to um, look at things from a, a post Second World War uh, perspective, which is, is um, easy for us to do. Um, we know what happened. The reality in 1936, when uh, Lloyd George is making overtures towards Nazi Germany, is that his um, position of engagement with Germany is broadly supported by um, by Parliament, and that the um, those that cry uh, appeasement later on at Chamberlain, the likes of obviously Winston Churchill, are in the minority and considered to be out of step and considered to be on really the, the wrong side of, of history. Now, it would it, events would prove Churchill correct, but in 1936-1937, um, he was certainly far from being um, a figure... Uh, at the the heart of uh, of politics and seen as a kind of quite a kind of marginal voice in Parliament, so it's important to look um, at what Lloyd George was doing in context. Not for a moment, so I'm arguing that uh, uh, engagement with Hitler on any level was in any way justifiable. Far from it. Anyway, let's look. Let's go into um, the uh, into examining this. Now, tonight I'm working from Lloyd George, Statesman or Scoundrel by Richard Wilkinson, sent to me by my good friends at IB Taurus, plug there, Um, and it's uh, an interesting all-round biography of uh, Lloyd George, and it talks talks about this rather, uh, this this kind of the duality uh, of him. Statesman or scoundrel? Well, kind of both, really. Now, I don't intend to do a kind of a full biography of Lloyd George because uh, obviously you get trying to get that one into twenty-five minutes is is very difficult. But um, Statesman or Scoundrel by Richard Wilkinson is definitely for anyone that is interested in the First World War, interested in the Liberal Party and the People's Budget, and interested in the the, the messy and ugly compromises at the end of the war with the Paris Peace Conference, and everything that Lloyd George does between 1918 and 1923, including his involvement in the uh, Greek uh, Turkey, the Greco-Turkish War, um, the first real kind of um, bloodbath to embrace Europe uh, outside of Poland and Russia um, after the First World War, it's really, really worth uh, worth examining. By 1931, and the establishment of the, the national government, uh, in which um, Ramsay MacDonald and Chancellor Philip Snowden were the um, only uh, members of the uh, Labour Front bench in a government almost exclusively made up of, of conservatives. Both of them are later expelled from the, the Labour Party for forming a national government with the Tories. Um, Lloyd George at that time uh, is, a, 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 like Churchill, a, a, a figure in, in the wilderness. His, his health hadn't been that great. In August 1931, he'd had uh, a prostate operation. And all attempts to reintroduce himself to national politics failed. Um, the What remains of the Liberal Party saw him as kind of something of an embarrassment uh, and he was disliked immensely by the three most significant figures of the national government, Ramsay MacDonald, Stanley Baldwin and Neville Chamberlain. 
Um, and even his friendship with Churchill starts to, to fray Churchill by this point having defected to the Conservative Party. And it's interesting to think of Churchill because Churchill's own fate after the World War, firstly uh, in opposition and secondly then back in government being gradually undermined by the likes of uh, Anthony Eden, um, mirrors in the 1950s what um, happened to Lloyd George in the 1930s. Both men had been at the height of their powers uh, as war uh, warlords, really, as um, wartime prime ministers with vast, uh, almost quasi kind of autocratic powers in in some cases, to um, meet the challenge of world war uh, and a struggle for national survival, uh, and thereafter they go into uh, into decline. The Liberal Party, which had also divided between uh, the, f- the two figures of Sir John Simon and uh, Sir Herbert Samuel, um, both of whom had um, vacated the, the national government, um, were uh, it was an unwelcome home for Lloyd George, um, having uh, been uh, he had blotted his copybook many times during the First World War and during the, the period of the uh, the first coalition with the Conservatives. There was always the suspicion from the Tories and the Liberals that Lloyd George was going to attempt to steal uh, a chunk of both of their parties and establish some kind of third party um, in the, the centre ground of politics uh, in, in a coup to uh, destroy both of them. And whilst this never happens, there's always a suspicion that it might. What seems to be the case is that Lloyd George seemed to have lost his uh, almost um, supernatural instinct for um, politics and for political manoeuvring. And once that had gone, it it doesn't return. Um, He was in, you know, as we've said, questionable health, but mentally he seems to have been kind of compass mentis. He eventually um, suffers from dementia, but that is in uh, the last few months of, of his life in 1945. Uh, in, in the early 1930s, he is uh, still kind of all there. Um, he spent a lot of time on his estate at Chert um, doing uh, farming and devoting himself to um, solutions uh, to the the Great Depression. Um, Radical interventionism uh, in the economy, such as uh, what was being uh, seen in uh, America uh, with Roosevelt's Great Depression, and even being uh, proposed by the likes of Oswald Mosley, who before he formed the British Union of Fascists, formed the New Party in 1931 and proposed the Mosley Manifesto, which was uh, sufficiently economically radical, involving um, state intervention in the uh, economy and state direction of the economy in the interests of the majority of the population, that it was even backed by the likes of an Iron Bevan. In 1935, Lloyd George uh, launched the Council of Action for Peace and Reconstruction, um, which was a, a think tank uh, to um, suggest uh, state interventionist ideas on the lines of the, the New Deal. Um, but the, this was roundly dismissed by the Cabinet. Um, the Cabinet had been committed to austerity policies not dissimilar to the ones that uh, Britain currently experiences, um, the reason for this was that following the end of the First World War, Britain owed an immense amount of debt to uh, America, particularly to uh, Wall Street banks. The debt, repayable in pounds, um, needed to be serviced, and this meant that uh, Britain's kind of economic leeway in terms of uh, spending on the British economy was limited, not because there were um, Wall Street bankers saying, why are you spending money on social welfare before 
paying uh, us back. Um, though that was obviously something that they, they, they did say. But because any um, increase in taxation in order to pay for social welfare affected uh, the value of the pound itself. Whilst the pound was on the, uh, on the gold standard at the beginning of the 1930s, the gold standard wasn't completely fixed and could um, be uh, adjusted based on the, the level of uh, interest in investment in the British economy. And the result was that um, American banks did not wish to see one of their creditors spending lots of money. And there was always the threat that there would be a run on the pound, that American banks would simply sell um, Britain's debt um, and sell any um, pound, any sterling holdings uh, they might have. And this left Britain uh, beholden to Wall Street. So uh, Lloyd George's ideas, um, his New Deal sort of notions, were unlikely to get off the ground. The crisis that presented Lloyd George with an opportunity was the Italian invasion of Abyssinia and the secret machinations of uh, Samuel Hall and Pierre Laval, the uh, British and uh, French diplomats who uh, drew up the Hall-Laval Pact, which essentially enabled uh, Mussolini uh, in his quest to seize Abyssinia. Richard Wilkinson writes on this subject. Lloyd George, however, erupted like a volcano after the outbreak of the Abyssinia crisis in October 1935. The government failed to implement an effective policy against Mussolini's pursuit of an African empire. Half-hearted economic sanctions were applied, but only too soon abandoned. The Mediterranean fleet could have blocked the Suez Canal, thus spoiling Mussolini's game, but a mad dog attack by the Italian Air Force on British ships was feared, so once again nothing was done. A craven decision, especially when one recalls the abysmal record of the Italian armed forces in the Mediterranean five years later. Eden, the League of Nations specialist, was dispatched to Geneva to tell the League that Britain could no longer offer effective support. Half a League, half a League, Half a league onward into the valley of death, quipped the cynics. Such cynicism was taken a, f- a stage further when the foreign ministers of Britain and France conferred in Paris to produce the Hall Laval Pact, whereby Mussolini was invited to accept the more desirable parts of Abyssinia if he called of his army, now employing poison gas against the indigenous tribesmen. The outcry in Britain was deafening, led by George V who greeted Hall when he resigned with seals of office somewhat heartlessly. Do you know what they are saying, or they are saying? No more coals to Newcastle, no more halls to Paris. Both Pact and Foreign Secretary were disowned, while Hitler exploited his potential enemy's disarray by remilitarising the Rhineland in March 1936. On the 18th of June 1936, it was announced that Anthony Eden, now Foreign Secretary, would report to Geneva that the government had abandoned economic sanctions as they were clearly not working, whereupon Lloyd George tore into the government, delivering what Churchill called the finest parliamentary oration he had ever heard. It was certainly an effective mugging job, though maybe the right way out of the Abyssinia crisis was not quite so simple as Lloyd George seemed to believe. This is Lloyd George. I cannot imagine a more serious debate than that which we are going through now. If the policy of the government is to materialise, if we are going to Geneva to say, we are beaten, the League has failed, we do not propose any further sanctions, believe me, that is an end to the authority of the League of Nations. The Foreign Secretary referred this afternoon to the well-ordered ranks of the League. They have not broken away, and he is not going there now to break them. He is going to Geneva to smash the League of Nations. This is a unique occasion. I have been in the house for nearly half a century. I am sorry to say, and I cannot recall an occasion quite like this. I have never before heard a British minister come down to the House of Commons 
and say that Britain was beaten. Here is the resolute aim. Here is the resolute footstep running away. The speech of the Chancellor of the Exchequer has been quoted. I am going to do myself the honour of reading part of it again. And he quotes, The choice before us is whether we should make a last effort at Geneva for peace and security, or whether by a cowardly surrender we should break all the promises we have made and hold ourselves up to the shame of our children and our children's children. Tonight we have a cowardly surrender, and there are the cowards. So a fine piece of speech-making, though as the author suggests, perhaps um, slightly disingenuous, uh, as we shall see. So the uh, condemnation that um, Lloyd George re reserves for the British government and their dealings with Mussolini is slightly at odds with his later treatment of Hitler. Um, until up until the outbreak of the Second World War, um, the um, uh, Lloyd George had sympathies for Nazi Germany. And I'm not suggesting that Lloyd George was in any way uh, fascist or racist in his outlook at all. That's not what I mean by sympathies. But he was sympathetic towards um, Germany and harboured views that Britain had um, humiliated Germany along with the uh, French and the Americans at Versailles, and that if they wound up with a revanchist regime, as they certainly did with the Nazis, then it was, it was hardly surprising. Lloyd George had, um, throughout the 1920s, uh, seen opportunities to be, uh, un un in some cases, unduly sympathetic towards Weimar Germany, Despite how we see it in, in black and whites, uh, Weimar Germany had little interest in keeping up full reparations uh, repayments, still had territorial ambitions in the East after the signing of the Locarno Treaties in 1925. Um, there was um, the quiet abandonment by the British and the French of commitments towards uh, Czechoslovakia and, and Poland and uh, the democratic Weimar government knew this full well and intimated strongly that it may wish to rearrange those borders at some point in the near future. So there was uh, there were great sympathies that Lloyd George had towards Weimar Germany's uh, rights to gradually dismantle aspects of the Treaty of Versailles and these um, sympathies don't really end when Hitler comes to power in January 1933. Hitler had previously spoken highly of Lloyd George. Um, he had mentioned him in uh, Mein Kampf. He had said, The primitive quality of those speeches, the originality of his expression, his choice of pure and simple illustration, are examples which prove the superior political capacity of this, and here where we see um, Hitler's basic ignorance, who refers to Lord George as an Englishman. Obviously he's not, he's Welsh, he's from Wales, and um, the idea that Great Britain is a, a multi-ethnic society with uh, different distinct nations within it was probably lost on, uh, on, on Hitler himself. He was highly provincial uh, in his outlook. Hitler put out the feelers to see if uh, Lloyd George might visit Germany, uh, and Lloyd George's vanity and, and ego were definitely stroked by this. And the fact that the British government had rejected uh, Lloyd George's state interventionist ideas, and at first glance it looked like these sorts of ideas were being embraced in Germany, um, was a, an excellent reason for the... Uh, uh, for Lloyd George uh, to go and see his, uh, as he saw it, his concepts in action and for his, his wounded ego uh, to be nursed uh, by uh, the Nazi regime. Lloyd George set off for uh, Bavaria uh, to go to the Berghof in September 1936 
By this point, of course, the Rhineland has been remilitarized, uh, the Nuremberg laws have been passed the year before that, and the SA have, has been br brutally murdered, its leadership brutally murdered in 1934. All of this is public knowledge, and Lloyd George had to really turn a blind eye uh, in order to uh, continue with the trip. And the uh, conveyor of the invite was none other than Joachim von Ribbentrop, who by 1936 was Hitler's ambassador to London uh, and Germany making a, a very poor job of trying to draw Britain into a full alliance with Nazi Germany. And there is the odd spectacle of the, the two men um, lavishing praise on one another um, over lunch and gradually... The real reason for the meeting emerges. Hitler attempts to present himself to Lloyd George as being eminently reasonable, a man who wished to have friendly relations with the British Empire um, and wished to reassure, to show that Germany would be um, a good neighbour in Europe, as long as Germany, of course, was enabled to make certain changes in Europe without being unduly bothered by anybody else. Hitler seems to have known exactly how to uh, speak to Lloyd George in order to get a, a favourable response. He said famously that the war would be won uh, due to one statesman, a great statesman, yourself, Mr Lloyd George. It was you who rallied the people and gave them the determination for victory. If I, instead of being one of many millions of German private soldiers, had been in the position of a leader instead of being subject at any time to have been shot, even by black troops, uh, matters would have been very different. I convinced that if I had been in power then, I could have prevented Germany's downfall. Uh, astonishing that Hitler, even in that little oration, manages to inject some racism into the conversation. He had sold Lloyd George on Germany's intentions, however, at the end of the meeting. And uh, he, Lloyd George came away believing that Hitler was an immense admirer and a devotee of the British Empire, um, and that, Louis, that Hitler saw the British Empire as essential to maintaining, maintaining some kind of racial stability uh, in the world. And of course there were the um, obligatory visits to various sites and farms and factories and workshops around the new Germany to show how Nazism was uh, supposedly working, but Lloyd George is really in a, a hurry to get home to start his uh, new role as a, an advocate for Nazi Germany, extolling the virtues of peaceful good relations and that um, the George Washington of Germany, as he refers to him, or Germany's resurrection and light, uh, could be trusted to be um, a good friend to Great Britain. Uh, he wrote um, gushing articles uh, in the Daily Express and the News Chronicle. Um, these were not uh, given a free pass by uh, Lloyd George's critics and by the population at large, as the, the knowledge of uh, concentration camps and anti-Semitism um, was widespread. And th there's an interesting detail in The Morbid Age by Richard Overy, which I know is a book I've referred to uh, many times, where he does a kind of statistical analysis of newspaper coverage in uh, 1933 and shows that uh, over the, um, uh, the way in which newspapers reported Nazi Germany and the way in which uh, audiences read about Nazi Germany was overwhelmingly negative, that the vast majority of the population had an immensely dim view of Nazi Germany, and that people like uh, apologists for Hitler, like Lloyd George and obviously um, Edward VIII, um, were uh, not very well received. And as overall, a positive view of the Soviet Union was far more likely in the press and in public opinion during that time. Anyway, I'll finish there, but the, the kind of the takeaway here really is that Lloyd George in his later years, um, marginalised from power but desperate to have significance again, was uh, easily seduced by Hitler, who understood probably uh, that Lloyd George uh, 
required flattery. Perhaps Hitler was a genuine admirer. Um, and that in, order to, in return for that, Lloyd George would become a useful advocate. OK, so if you um, want to catch more of the uh, Explaining History content, why not check out our Patreon page? Uh, there's some original long-form journalism there. I'll be adding some more pretty soon. Um, you can sponsor us, obviously, every little helps. And um, I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. Thanks, all the best, bye-bye.